Hello, everyone. Today, I am so excited because our guest is Phil Lockwood, and Phil is CEO, actually founder and CEO of Distill Marketing Agency. And I met Phil because we were working together with his son, Colt, who is an ENTP. Phil is an INTP, super fascinating personality type, and that stands for introverted, intuitive, thinking, and perceiving. And Phil, I don't know if you remember me telling you this, but I grew up with an INTP. Uh, you know, I, I think that it could be any number of different directions that we could go with that, but I was, I was very creative. Um, yeah. So I like, got into art as a kid and was very good at drawing. And that uh, you know, between that and wanting to be a pilot since I was about two years old, that pretty much dominated everything that I did and thought and said and focused on. So now hold on. So how did you decide at two years old that you wanted to be a pilot? How did that come <laughs> about? Was your father a pilot? How were you exposed to that? I could never get a straight answer from my parents. And of course, I was too little to even remember. My mom jokes that I came out when I was born. I came out going, like making an airplane. <laughs> my hand. But I do remember going to a Thunderbirds air show when I was really little. I don't remember if that was because I was into aviation or if it happened the other way around. Uh -huh. uh, I remember flying in an airplane with some friends of my parents when I was about that same age. So it's possible that it was during that period of time or could have been a toy that I got when I was even younger than that. So I really have no idea, but as long as I can remember. Wow. That's so interesting. And then you were really singular focused on, mm -hmm. on that. Um, but that has not been the case for you because that's kind of not typical of an INTP and INTP has multitudinal, is that a word? Interests, you know? <laughs> um, so they're possibilitarian you know, possibilities are your friend, you know? And so has that always been the case for your singular focus or have you had all these diverse interests? Well, I would say it's kind of a combination in the sense that when there's something that I find I have an interest in, I kind of um, I really focus on that. I mean, to the point of just being obsessed with it almost, mm -hmm. but that, that focus tends to change. <laughs> so this is kind of where this whole concept of always be changing, which is one of our corporate values and then turned into our family values really came from, uh, you could call it shiny object, object syndrome or, <laughs> you know, whatever. But yeah, uh, I, I would say it's amazing that I went through my entire childhood thinking pilot, 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 because now the, the time span for these interests tends to be maybe more in months or sometimes even weeks versus years. <laughs> yeah, so what Phil just talked about was always be changing ABC. That is his YouTube channel. And why don't you talk about that, how that came about, Phil, as one of your changes. You did a really quick flip from suburbia, well, to beach. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> just real quickly summarize that where that's coming from. Yeah. So again, always be changing the concept here is that, it, you know, some people think of it as a bad thing if you switch from one thing to another, but the reality is that's my personality. Erin, my wife's very on board with it. She's very supportive. So we've just decided that the concept of constant change is one of our, one of our core values. And last year, it was a little over a year ago, we decided to sell our house in Denver, which we had pretty much just finished customizing to sell that and then instead buy in Coronado, where we've enjoyed vacationing as a family for, I don't know, a better part of a decade. So decided to kind of document that journey by doing videos of that and primarily on YouTube, but other social channels as well. And just kind of, I don't know, try to connect with other people who maybe can appreciate that mindset, even if they don't share that mindset uh, of uh, constant change in life, you know? And if, if there's something you wanna do, do it, do it frequently, do it as quickly as you can. Um, don't put things off. That, that was kind of the concept is just deciding to go after, instead of planning for the life of our dreams, which we had been doing for years to say, we're starting it right now. We're gonna put it into action. I love that. 
I love that. <laughs> so as a kid, other than um, you coming out, you know, with your airplane, <laughs> like your mom said, um, what were some other, what would you say, how are you in school? Like, how are you as a student in school, would you say? Started off really strong. Elementary school was very strong. Got good grades. Uh, I always was, uh, I battled daydreaming a lot. So I would daydream through a lot of stuff, but luckily uh, it didn't affect my <laughs> grades or my ability to learn. Yeah. Uh, started reading at a very early age. My mom says I taught myself to read when I was like four. So um, that, yes. that really helped. And I really enjoyed math. So I had a, a good mix that helped me do really well. But and in junior high, probably the the catalyst for change was girls, girlfriends. Mm. And, you know, that really becoming a distraction. And so I started getting C's, uh, <laughs> which I thought was awful, but nothing compared to what was to come in high school. <laughs> but just spent all my time thinking about girls and, um, you know, hanging out with girlfriends and just trying to, I don't know, find my way socially, I guess. And uh, well, so I wanted to ask you about that because INTPs tend to not have a lot of game because they social interaction, like extroverted feeling, which is harmonizing in a social situation, kind of knowing, you know, what to do in a social situation, which is basically your wife, Erin, is completely comfortable in that that yeah. is your most inferior function and so what an intp tends to do is tell it like it is blunt without any frills like you know you'll see truth you'll see absurdity and you'll say that's stupid you know just playing it on out you'll call people on their bs you know their belief system i got that from personality hacker you'll, you'll call them on their <laughs> bs you know and you don't sugarcoat it and so so tell me how that played out and how you were able to kind of get your game to, to you know, have girlfriends and all that. I was awful at it. And I think a lot <laughs> hasn't changed. I mean, in terms of those types of interactions, social interactions, uh -huh. I feel mm -hmm. pretty much the same way going to a party today that I would have in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I mean, I never, I, I don't know when I first asked a girl out, I was probably in my mid twenties. And so I was able to rely on uh, just having some girls to essentially ask me out. Uh, I remember my first girlfriend, Becky, in junior high, and uh -huh. she made everything happen. You know, it was like nice me effort into the initial outreach. You know, getting that ball rolling. Um, I would. It was low hanging fruit for me. Whichever girls talked to me and initiated, and that I would found attractive in some way, shape, or form. Those are the, those are the relationships that happened. Right. So. It's not that you had these dating relationships, which were causing you to get C's. It was just that your your mind was elsewhere, not on your studies. Yes. Yeah. Now, did you did you get really good grades? Well, you said you got C's, but were you able to do well on tests like without studying, even though, you know, because INTPs, what I've seen in, in the kids that I've worked with and the families I worked with is that they might be playing video games. 24 seven, not doing well in their grades, but then they ace the SAT or the ACT because they're just mm -hmm. brilliantly smart. Mm -hmm. I didn't have straight C's, which is to say that I actually had, uh, you know, really good grades in certain subjects and then poor grades in other subjects. So any of those like math where everything was just kind of logical and I, you could figure it out, I wouldn't have to do homework. I wouldn't have to pay attention in class and I could still test very well. And, and I got mm -hmm. it up to a certain point. Once we got into algebra, that changed because there were new concepts that you have to learn. You have to, you had to, you have to be taught the concepts. Yeah. But so like social studies was the very first class that I started doing poorly. And I didn't find it particularly interesting at the time. Yeah. And you can't make up, you know, history or yeah. Global, you know, geopolitics. I mean, you have to learn that stuff. You have to read it. So without doing right. that, my grades really started to drop there. Same thing with right. literature. You're not going to score well in, a, in a, a test about Macbeth if you don't read Macbeth. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So how, how were your parent, how were you parented? Like what, what would you say your parents did well? What would you say they didn't understand about you? Were they trying to 
kind of force a square peg into a round hole sometimes because you're this really unique temperament? You know, we had such a dynamic childhood. My parents, my mom and dad were polar opposites, which is potentially what led to them divorcing when I was in first grade. Okay. Um, but I was born, uh, I have an older brother who was adopted. He was a foster kid shortly before I was born. And then I have a biological sister who's only about a year and a half younger. And then my parents adopted a girl from Korea. And this was all when I was still like kindergarten age, essentially. And then they enjoyed that Korean adoption experience so much. They brought four more foster kids over from Korea. So we had eight kids. Wow. Living in the house. So there was just so much change in terms of, you know, what parenting was like and what my relationship with my parents was like, what my... My, my position within the whole family was like so there wasn't there wasn't real consistency at that period of time um you know like no kind of abuse whatsoever verbal anything like that um they were very focused on effective communication I do remember one time I was like just kind of lightly kicking um one of my sisters while she was standing in front of the mirror I was just kind of like kicking her butt lightly playing around again, first grade or something. And she started crying. And then my parents, uh, I remember they called me down and they were like, so let's talk about that. You know, that's not the way to behave. And kind of seems like, do you want attention? Cause if you want attention, all you need to do is come to us and say, mom, dad, I kind of need some attention right now. And so I remember using that then repeatedly after that, sometimes I'd be like, I just feel like I need attention. So I'd go tell them, I need some attention. And you know, they'd drop everything and give me some attention. Um, again, that was that's, a that's so interesting. Something so simple, such a simple tool really helped you out. Now, somebody, so INTPs do have a lot of social anxiety. And I have worked with a lot of INTPs that like, it really is debilitating for them, like giving a speech, uh, a pub, you know, public speaking, it, uh, you know, it's scary for everyone. But to the point of where they want to throw up. It's just debilitating anxiety when it comes to putting yourself out there because INTPs are very self-contained. They're very confident when they're on their own and they're very confident in their belief system and their value system um, and their intelligence and all that. But when they put it out there in the world for people to observe, that's when they get very, very anxious. So I'm wondering if, if you experienced any of that. Yeah, thinking back to school and, um, you know, having to get up in front of the class and do presentations, I don't remember that being much of an issue, but anything else where I felt like I was being called upon to perform in some way, shape or form, certainly uncomfortable and is to this day. Um, I don't dance, never have danced because I feel like it's performing. <laughs> but I saw <laughs> you on too. Instagram dancing with your wife at some function. I saw that. So you, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I kind of, what kind of activities were you in, in school? You know, what did you like? What did you not like? Sounds like your parents were too busy to try to force you into anything. Yeah, well, like elementary school, I like doing pretty much anything physical like most kids do. So, you know, track and field kind of stuff, field days. Uh, I like running. I would run miles and miles with my uh, grandfather and uh, that, that sort of thing. Now, in junior high, when all of a sudden I was like, hey, I want to I want to be cool. Uh, I was like, I want to play football because I think it's cool. So I joined the football team and I didn't bother putting any work into it, learning plays or anything like that. I just wanted to be in the uniform because I thought that seemed cool. Uh, got into wrestling. <laughs> got into wrestling. This is why the girls were asking you out, right? <laughs> You're like, it worked. My plan worked. And then, so wrestling too. Wrestling uh, in junior high, and then did that into high school. Also, uh, I got into cycling, like probably eighth grade year, competitive cycling, and that was one that stuck with me for many, many years. So that was kind of my my primary. Uh, sport as a child. I worked at a bike shop for many years in high school too. So that definitely became a huge passion. Um, but I, I was into uh, outside of the sports stuff. I mean, my activities, I was very interested in aviation. So I started, my grandmother had an airplane. She started taking me up. I was flying when I was about 10. I started taking formal flight lessons at 15 or 14, um, soloed when I was 15. Um, anything space related. I was in Rocket Club 
total nerd thing, which I'm super proud of. Loved it. Uh, I probably built like a hundred rockets as a kid. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So your number one function, introverted thinking, is such a unique brain function. And they've actually looked at EEG maps of the brain. I don't know if you know this, Bill, but mm. out of 16 Myers-Briggs types, the INT brain has totally unique features to it that no other brain does. Like the way you problem solve, the way that you are able to um, just disassociate yourself emotionally from a problem and be super calm and, and go into that. And that analytical thinking and, um, you know, wanting to know how things work. And, you know, it sounds like you were kind of really had a aptitude for that at a really young age, like working in a bike shop and, you know, just understanding how things work and, you know, just clean, clean data that's based on logic and, um, so do you remember taking a lot of things apart as a kid and, and wondering how things worked and the structure underneath? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it was just part of uh, growing up. I, obviously, a, part, a lot of it would have to do with uh, my personality, but also it was the environment. Like uh, my dad was that way and my stepdad was that way too. So regardless of being at my mom's house or my dad's house, there was constantly like... Um, craft construction type of stuff going on you know as a kid I was like framing houses and just building things my dad had this big garage that was basically like a I mean it was a it was a tool shed kind of thing a workshop and so every every day on the weekends I was up and building something out there um, so to this day a lot of people like Aaron will see me maybe fix something and say where did you learn to do this and i always say it's just from a childhood full of tinkering you know when you tinker that much you just it's it's more and more data and so I, it's a it, i think it's the primary reason that i am handy like i am today i suppose well so when you have you know, your number one psychological function for you is introverted. So you don't even really know when it's at work because it's not an extroverted function. It's not, people can't really observe it. So your, your number two function is your extroverted function, which is extroverted intuition. And that is exploring. And what happens with a lot of INTPs is because they have that social anxiety, that extroverted feeling is their infant function, they can tend to loop their introverted functions and become very, very introverted and isolated because they just don't want to, they don't want to bother with feeling uncomfortable in a social situation. So they'd rather just be in their comfortable introverted world, a lot of INTPs will get lost in fantasy because they find the imaginary world, that's the intuition, the imaginary world and fantasy like video games is more exciting than the real world. And so it sounds like the way you were nurtured was that you had that exploration, just low hanging fruit right there. That, And that's your, that's your secondary extroverted intuition is your secondary psychological function. And that's where growth comes. That's where you find health in your personality. So for you, you were kind of forced to, to do, to explore and to have these experiences. You, you made yourself get on the football team. You made yourself go out for wrestling. You had a grandfather that you ran with. And so you did that. You got on your bike, you tinkered. I mean, you had all these experiences that helped you learn from life. And that's what extroverted intuition is. It's learning from experience. And the way you parent an INTP is you basically just let them go. And it's like, even though you had all these siblings and it might almost seem to you as an adult, like, wow, you know, what would have been like if I would have had more attention from my parents? But actually it's what you needed as an INTP to just kind of be let go to explore and do your thing. Mm. Yeah, so that's great that at least I would say both of my parents were kind of free range, my dad much more so. So that was a, that was very congruent, I guess, with um, what I needed to just be out there doing whatever 
I felt like doing on any given day. I'm not, I'm not a free range parent, so. You're not a free range parent? Right. Oh, tell me about that. Oh, <clears throat> it's a surprise, huh? Um, you just I don't feel know. like you're, is it because you felt like you wanted more connection from your parents and you want to be more of a connected dad? I don't think, so. I think a lot of it kind of comes down to um, fear over something happening to my kids. And a lot of that comes from experiences I had as a child. I mean, I had a lot of fr friends and um, cousins die, frankly, oh my goodness. crashing motorcycles, getting hit by cars, all sorts of things, you know, just lots of accidents. And so I was always very cautious as a child. I had a motorcycle uh, that I got when I was 10 and my friends had motorcycles and they'd be like jumping big hills and stuff. And I was always like, no, no, I always really take it easy. I was worried about getting hurt. Uh, so I think that that just, I feel like it's exactly the same thing, but now I project that onto our kids where I feel like there's too much physical risk, then my natural tendency is to try to avoid that with them, so. Because an I, now an INTP, like I said before, can be extremely introverted. And so did you have to kind of fight against that urge to just be introverted? I would say I still feel like I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it's to the point where, because I believe our minds can accomplish virtually anything, I'm not 100% sold on that being who I am forever. You know, I feel like I could reverse engineer or re-engineer myself, re, re, you know, hardwire my brain to be more extroverted, to be extroverted. Um, I, for the most part, in the majority of my life, I have thought of being an introvert as a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people do, which is really sad because it's actually brain chemistry. Like introverts use acetylcholine. I think I said that right, which is a different neurotransmitter, which actually makes you feel better when you turn inward. And extroverts use dopamine, which makes you feel better. You get that charge when you turn outward. And so it's actually just brain chemistry. And But our society tells us that it's not okay, you know, that we're supposed to have fun at the party and we're, you know, all that. And so I always call my INTPs that parents are parenting unicorns because the introvert goes against society, the intuitive goes against society because it's like being a left-hander in a right-handed world because our society is meant for the censors of the world. Um, the intuitives are in our head. We're more in our head than we are seeing details in the environment. Um, you're thinking about what if and what could be and what I'm going to invent and what I'm, you know, and, and then the, the thinker part, that's typical for a man because most men are thinkers, but as an INTP, as a kid, it can make you not make eye contact, not smile not be demonstrative with your emotions. And that goes against society because you're supposed to be this friendly and smiley and not a truth teller, not, you know, like you, you're a truth teller. Um, you know, you, you, if you call it like you see it and then, you know, the P make a goal, you know, go after that goal and check things off the list and stick with one thing. Don't change. Don't always be changing, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so all of those things go against the way society is. And for some reason, we think that we need to mold ourselves into that, which you have done to some extent, but yet you've kept that original, unique side of yourself. So it all resonates for sure. So an INTP is very idealistic and that intuition really, like I said before, is more, more concerned about what could be and what if. And so how did that play out with you? Were you did you ever feel restless as a kid, like bored easily, like you wanted to do something bigger? I wouldn't say that wanting to do something bigger in the sense of say ambition was a thing with me until I was in my early twenties, but just always wanting to be out doing something interesting. Um, 
uh, and this is maybe neither here nor there, but you you mentioned like the video game thing, and I never really got into video games. I you know grew up in rural Indiana and on a horse ranch and like a motorcycle. So again, I was always outside wanting to do something. Um, I would have ideas that, you know, I, I remember one time I decided to want to make my sister a kite. So I got up at 4 a.m. on Saturday, like I always did. And I went out to the garage and I pulled all these materials together and made this kite that, that wouldn't even fly. It was awful. But, uh, <laughs> you know, just little projects like that, that I would always be working on something. I always had some kind of a, a project that I was involved in. Yeah, I think that our world today has shrunk. You know, I think it's shrunk to this, you know, our phones. This is, you know, and so an INTP can hide in that. You know, they can they can just make their world be this and a screen and video games. And you did not grow up that way. And so, you know, I just think for parents of INTPs, like, get them out there with new experiences and maybe not the traditional like be on a team because that's going to make their social anxiety come out and their performance anxiety come out but get them out there on a horse ranch get them out there on a you know tinkering get them out there just in the you know where they can explore camping hiking boy scouts you know you brought up your nerdy rocket club you know just places where they can go and not feel pressure to do the right thing socially, but they can have these experiences. I mean, it sounds like that was just so valuable for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I kind of struggle with this again, from a parenting perspective, uh, and primarily with Colt and what's his, he's what's his, ENTP. What are his letters? ENTP. Yeah. So it it's, just means that he's flipped so that that extroverted uh, intuition or exploring, learning from life. That example of where he took the, didn't he hawk a loogie up against the wall or something just to see what would happen? Aaron was telling Yeah, that me. sounds right. But anyway, <laughs> they, they seem like they're being naughty, but they're just being little scientists that are just exploring because they want to learn from, from experience. So often with him, I, I was actually going down this path of uh, just thinking about how he really pushes me outside of my comfort zone in terms of the activities that he wants to be a part of. You know, I, I'm like, let's, let's keep things close here. Let's, let's stay at home. Like I said, not that free range thing, but he is so into sports. He always wants to be outside. He, he decided he wanted to start fishing and now he wants to go fishing in the Bay all the time. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see how much he is just fighting to be able to explore and, and, and to experiment. And, you know, he, he breaks everything and <laughs> it's, it's like daily. And I remember being that way as a kid too, things, I had a, a shingle that was on a, a shed and I was like, oh, that's an interesting texture. And then I learned that if I had bent it enough, it would just have this satisfying snap and break in half. And so it's just destroying <laughs> this roof on this shed. He'll do stuff like that every day. You, so it's just, inc- yeah. Were you, did you ever get in trouble? for that experimentation? How, were you handled? I did. How, how were you handled? Did you feel like you weren't understood in that sense that your motives were not, you know, your intentions were not to be bad. It was just this, this insatiable curiosity. That's kind of, that's childhood in general, right? I mean, you <laughs> you, you don't necessarily know why you're doing things. You don't know what the, what the motivation is. You just make mistakes. And so I really remember that every time I, I don't yell at Cole for breaking things, um, I just try to get him into a mindset of recognizing. And so I have this little uh, trick that I use with him, chickity check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know, the, the ice tea song, ice tea, ice cube, ice cube song. Uh, <laughs> I so don't. I, I want to get him like a, I want to get him a watch or something that just vibrates like once every five minutes. And just to say, when you feel that vibration, think about what you're doing right now and whether or not it's a good idea. But when I, yeah, when I would get in trouble for doing those things as a kid, I mean, why did you do that? And I'm like, I have no idea. I mean, I just, just felt like doing it. Well, you've said and, a couple of things that, that are really not like you would, you said, isn't that every kid? Well, you have a couple of kids who is, who does that more? Out uh, of your- well, the destroying things. Yes. Oh yeah, he's the only one. 
Yeah. <laughs> so it's not every kid. It's it's the the kids. These are the kids that parents are calling me about. It's not their kid like Erin, your wife. She's an ESFJ. They don't call me about their little errands. They call me about their little fills. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's not every kid. It's, you know, the INTP, the ENTP, they're so curious and they learn by doing. And so it just seems like they are bent set on breaking things and being that typical Dennis the Menace kind of kid, but that's not their intent at all. Yeah. And so I, I love your ice was it ice cube chickity check it's ice cube yeah I, ice cube. Okay. i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to look into that that's awesome so so how did you intps usually struggle all through you know high school and then and even college a bit and you know it's kind of sad and i don't know if you have heard this but in the myers-briggs st statistics INTPs are one of the highest types for mental illness, substance abuse, and suicide because they feel isolated, because they end up isolating themselves, because they feel uncomfortable uh, socially. They tend to um, be really hard on themselves, self-critical. They um, have these huge ideals of what they want to do because they have this amazing mind and they're super smart but they can't bring it into reality um, because they're relaxed and chill. They can be quite funny and, and chill and relaxed. And so, um, and so they, they have actually high suicide rate. They're like in the top three. And so I'm just wondering if you found, when do you feel like you, I mean, it sounds like you really were pretty comfortable in your own skin for a lot of the time, just because of all your experiences, but what was college like for you? Well, it was very atypical for one thing, because I don't know if we've talked about this, but I went to the Air Force Academy and oh. I was only there for a year and a half and resigned. And then I went to the University of Colorado, two partial semesters. I basically dropped out two semesters in a row and never went back. So I had no degree. And even the time that I spent in college was um, without focus without progress really. But in terms of the social component, um, it was challenging partly because of my military service. And I, I mean, moving around a lot, I think it really makes it difficult, especially for an introvert to not have those lifelong friends that you then do, go to college with and then still hang out with. I mean, I had none of that. I was making all new friends every six to 12 months during that period of time. So it was a lot of I guess loneliness, but not in a depressing way, just in a, this is life kind of way. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's so interesting for parents to know that you landed on your feet, even though you went into the military, that didn't work out for you. Did you just, was the discipline of that, was that just crushing for you, soul crushing for you? No, that was awesome. I mean, like in high school, my bedroom, when I finally got my own bedroom after my brother moved out, I mean, I had everything in its place. I, I hyper-organized. So that aspect of military really suited me. Yes. It's it like was. you had no choice, like, because you, INTPs can be scattered, that squirrel syndrome that you talked about right now, which you've been able to find that beautiful balance, you know, um, and so as a younger person, you really liked the structure of that. And that's actually your, your tertiary function is introverted sensing, which is Aaron's number two, but it's that comfort of structure. And, you know, like you said, having those friends and those memories and, you know, that's like a, a comfort for, to you. And so, you, you know, the comfort of the military then, um, but so that's not why you got out. So why did you get out and... I only was in, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And once uh, there were military cutbacks at the time and Air Force Academy graduates were no longer getting pilot slots. So once I decided unlikely that I'm going to uh, become a fighter pilot, I was like, no, no more need for me to be in the military at this point, I'm gonna go do something else. Was that a big identity crisis for you since you had been wanting to do that your whole mm -hmm. life? 
Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I remember after resigning from the Air Force Academy, just a, a matter of months later, I had a kind of conversation with my parents over the phone where I was like, this is, this is a first for me because every day of my entire life that I can recall, I've known exactly what I was headed toward. And now I have no idea what I'm going to do. So it was, it was, it was an issue. I mean, in reference to, you know, the mental health stuff that you're talking about, I never felt like uh, clinically depressed or anything, even though technically you could say I was depressed because I just wasn't as happy-go-lucky and and focused and, and driven as I had been previously. But it was just kind of a, a boring question mark of a time for me. I think a lot of INTPs, though, in college especially, will kind of numb, they'll numb themselves with alcohol or with drugs now, like marijuana. Um, you know, so that can, that can come into, the, into play, too, like substance abuse to just kind of escape from reality in that sense. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so, so, but I want to point out to parents that you didn't take, you took a really traditional path with the military and then college, but that path wasn't your path. And INTPs can tend to be that type that they, they can take a traditional path or not. And you ended up becoming an entrepreneur. So you found your way um, just with your intelligence and your exploratory nature, you found your way. So can you talk briefly to, to how that happened and maybe encourage parents out there to, you know, if your INTP doesn't take a traditional path, don't despair? Yeah, I definitely think that that personality component has played a lot into what I've been able to accomplish. And I'll say that professionally speaking, even though I own an agency that's been successful for a couple of decades now, I still feel like I'm coming up way, way, way short on where I should be mm-hmm. on the professional side, what I'm capable of. Um, but more as like a, a father and as a husband, I feel like I was able to intuit what I should be doing along the way. And that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, Some of that happened, almost all of that growth actually happened since Erin and I started dating. And, you know, she sets a a good example of what a a marriage is supposed to be about. But also when my oldest daughter was born, I'd say maybe when she was one, right around that time, I went from being kind of a dick, you know, very focused on image and, you know, I wanted to be like, have a Hollywood lifestyle to say, no, no, no. I want to be a dad. You know, I want to be, uh, I want to be a good father. And it really settled me down and I started making better decisions there. So we, we didn't even get into this, but um, as a child, I would, uh, I would do things that were very questionable morally, you know, stealing stuff. Uh, I was actually arrested one time in high school. That's a whole other story. But <laughs> to then I'm glad you said that, though, because for these parents that have INTPs that are like, he seems a little too perfect. I'm glad you, I'm glad you pointed that out. But yeah, I was able to figure things out was to, to get myself to a point where I am an upstanding member of society and without other people forcing me to do it. You know, I think when like to go back, circle back to the beginning of this discussion, that the desire and the capability to really reverse engineer, figure out how things work is what allowed me to do that, to understand this is, um, this is who I need to be. This is what I need to be focused on. This is what's important and to turn into somebody who's, uh, like you said, I don't, I don't think my parents um, had any reason to ever worry about me if they ever did. Thank you so much for your insight, Phil. This has been really, really interesting. And your experience as an INTP was completely different from my brother's experience because my brother um, just, he fell into that self-consciousness of, and he even had some peculiar mannerisms like clearing his throat too much, um, you know, uh, not aware and um, not making eye contact, just not wanting to be around people. And so he kind of ended up becoming a hermit in his room. He had a record album collection um, where he would rate them like Casey Kasem and make billboard lists. And 
and he, you know, just had these really unique quirks, but he was very, very introverted and um, he just didn't get out and have those experiences like he did. Um, so I think that's really that nurture piece, those circumstances really helped you to venture out and be who you are today. So, so everybody check Phil out. He's, um, you know, if you need marketing, he's a whiz at that, the distill marketing agency, where they, where can they find you? Um, as far as that goes, your website. That website is distillagency.com. And we might actually have a link from our personal or family website, which has links to like all of our social and, okay. and other websites. And that's followabc.com. So follow abc.com and that's their YouTube channel. So you're, if you're an INTP watching this and you'd like to see Phil's always be changing life. And it's so interesting because his wife is an ESFJ, which they love security. Um, but she also has this adventurous side to her with, she has extroverted intuition as her fun psychological function. It's her 10 year old. So she's like, woohoo. So, you know, you guys, are this really great, great match for each other. And, you know, so um, we don't have to tell you that though, because you've been married for how long now? 10 years. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, Phil. Well, thank you so much for this interview. Thanks a lot. Good to see you.